here we are again, and I'm going to talk about 3.6, the new release that's released today. Um, and before we do, I just want to say how great it is to see a room full of people, that, an enormous number of you. I have no idea who you are. It's great. <laughs> it's, it's not like in with lots of other languages and things, then it's just this old group of old guys sitting outside the cafe complaining about the good old days. There are people here who 25 years ago weren't even born. This is great. Um, it's a very different sort of a community. So now, as I've only got 20 minutes, talking about 3.6. And this is, it's a nice release because so on the first glance, it looks like there's not very much there. And then if you look a little bit more, there's lots of nice new things which don't only make things faster or easier to use. Unusually, there are a lot of features in there that will mean that, with a bit of luck, the sort of systems you'll be writing with KDP Plus will be quite different within a year or so because there's new toys we're giving you that we didn't have before. So first, I'll start by talking about some of the, the boring things to get them out of the way before we get on to the interesting ones. So the first thing is the bytecode limits. This is a thing that over years, lots of you have been victims of me with this, that you complain about how you get the const error and stuff and you can't have more locals. And I explain to you very carefully why this is fine and you should be used to this and it's not a problem. <laughs> and then, uh, if you know I've got that CSV guess and CSV util thing, that started giving me those errors too. Then it was just not, not funny anymore. <laughs> so, so we changed now. Yeah, because you can have far, far more globals and stuff like that. So it's partly because of me, uh, but it was also just that we're getting more and more people coming from completely different languages and they don't accept our reasons for why this is a good idea. They're used to writing crap pages and pages full of it, and they see they should be able to continue to do that in K. <laughs> um, yeah. Can't win them all. The next thing that's a small thing, but it's very nice, is that we've got a native JSON now. Because we, and this is a nice example because we had um, the, K, the Q version, and that worked fine, but then we found, we sort of threw it out there to see, is anyone going to use this or not? And then we saw, my God, they're using it, and especially they're using it on large amounts of data. So it seemed like, that after all, this would be a good thing to have uh, native rather than just um, written in K. So we put it in, and it's, it's quite a bit faster, and people do seem to like using JSON. You have to wonder. <laughs> the next small thing we put in was, this was embarrassing. We had support for, initially, we only went back to about, I think it was the year 2000, wasn't it, or, some, or something like that. And I remember asking Arthur years ago, you know, why, why did we pick these date ranges? And he said, well, the, there was no big deal to it. Back when he was writing the very first version of K, then he wasn't sure what way to do it. And so he just looked at what Excel did and what Microsoft were doing. He thought, they must know what they're doing. So we just did that too. <laughs> um, man, was that a mistake. <laughs> if you've ever looked at 1899, 1231, you'll know just what a cesspit that is. So now we've, I think, I forget which release. It was maybe the, the last one. We put that you could have the larger dates, but we didn't have the parser for it. So you could have them, you could load them in via the back door, but you couldn't parse them from things like CSVs. So now you can. Another compression method. This one is just a nice one. LZ4 is just a very fast compressor and decompressor. It's just a nice one. It's available everywhere. The HC is high compression on the end of it. So like always with these things, uh, just try it out. Maybe it works really well on these five columns and is rubbish on these two, but you've got one more in your toolkit and this is one that our experience is it's pretty good and well behaved. 
Now we come to the first really interesting bit in, uh, I think it's one of the nicest things in 3.6, and that's deferred response. This is a thing that everyone suffered from it with. Uh, you have, your system is really smart, you've written everything with asynchronous messages, and it's, um, you're doing it properly, so it's not like Node.js, you know, you're people who understand how to do these things properly. And, but then you have clients talking to you who are fairly naive programmers, or they're not even programmers, they just need the numbers and they want to just get the stuff back out again. So they're writing completely synchronous queries. They do send in some whacking great query. It blocks your server till it's finished, and then the results come back again. And that really doesn't scale. It's just tiresome. And we've been trying to do something about it for a long time. Charlie <laughs> pointed out that this deferred response, this thing now that looks really tiny and trivial, and we could have probably done it on a rainy Friday afternoon. This is actually the fourth or fifth attempt at it until we got it, what we reckon is simple and right. And what it is, is that if you have a client who sends in a synchronous resp uh, request, you can, in the server, you can decide, okay, um, this looks pretty uh, hefty, this thing that's coming in. I'll fire it off to another server. So you can, you can do async on the server side, and the user is just put into a coma until you come back again. It looks to him like, okay, the system's a bit slow, but it's synchronous. And behind the scenes, you're just taking their allegedly synchronous request, firing it off async to another server, which will then reply async back again. When the reply comes in, you can say, okay, now I'll wake him up again and pretend I've been busy for him the whole time. <laughs> and it, he sees no difference. And you are uh, suddenly able to have an enormously better throughput compared to what you had before. You can be farming out these queries to, what should we say, 10, 20 different servers. What you're doing behind the scenes he doesn't know about, doesn't care about, but you've got much more freedom now. Instead of being bound to anything anybody sends in, you have to give him his synchronous reply back before you can do anything for anyone else. So this, I think, is really a big deal. And it's, it's not making KDB Plus faster, but it has the potential to make your end users, your sort of your far, far end users, think that, man, that new release, it makes everything run really way faster because you're able to handle all the other queries coming in. As the load gets heavy, you're able to just keep farming them off as asynchronous. So I find that's really nice. Use it. Uh, the next thing is GUIDs. Uh, this was interesting as well. This was a bit, this is a, a mea culpa as well from us, that when we put GUIDs in, then we have them hashed, that then everything, the lookup and everything runs really fast. But that, was, that hash was set up for our GUIDs, because if you've ever looked at the, the Wikipedia page for GUIDs, you'll see that it, there's a whole uh, science for itself of how you can generate the GUIDs, which um, digits you should, which ones you should use, how you could do it. And our format was great, gave good hashes, nice distribution of the data for our GUIDs. But lots of customers have sort of the, the corporate GUID, uh, what, server. They aren't allowed to use our GUIDs because you can't trust us necessarily. So you have to use different ones which are generated with different algorithms, put the weight on different bits in the GUID, and they were hashing terribly. So we were having an enormous number of collisions and things like that. So that meant that we had to fix that. And so we've got now a new GUID layout, a new, um, a new way of hashing them, and this is a change where if you've got uh, an attribute on the GUIDs, which you probably do, then there's a new format, and this is a format that 3.5 or earlier won't be able to read with attributes. So you'll have to decide, okay, this is one of the things where if we're moving to 3.6, we want to get the much faster GUID lookup, 
then there's a price to pay if you've got. Um, what is it? It's those um, imbecilic long numbers that people <laughs> apply for if you order anything from, I don't know, Amazon. Instead of giving you order 527, they give you something that's that long, that's allegedly unique. <laughs> the theory is they're always unique. And no one quite trusts it, but still. Next thing, this is a leftover from 3.0, really, of having 64-bit enumerations. So uh, the enumerations were 32-bit inside, and that was just a decision we made, because 3.0 was, what's that, something like seven years or so ago now. And back then, memory was just a lot smaller, sparser than it is now. And we didn't have so much space for keeping the, the pointers. So we thought, OK, then we just keep them 32-bit inside. That was a mistake. For, for enums, it's still fine, because there's limits to how far you want to go with them. And the same with foreign keys. But for linked columns, when you've effectively got sort of pointers within a list to itself again. So you can do things like, let's say, the hierarchy or tree descent and stuff, all within just one column. Then if, you can't, if you've got a thing that's three billion elements long, and you can only el um, link back to the first two billion of them, that's not very smart. So we had to change that. <laughs> and at the same time, then this old restriction on the number of enumerations you can have is gone as well. This again, of course, it's 64-bit enumerations instead of 32-bit. So this is incompatible if you're reading it from disk, the 32, uh, the 64-bit the enumerations. If things are going over TCP IP, then of course this is transparent still. But the, the enumerations on disk, they've, they're changing now. This was another tidying up the odds and ends, that you can have uh, compound objects, so whatever types they are, can have 64-bit length. Now, this is just convenience again. Right, I'm told five minutes. The, the last big new thing is what's called any map. And Pierre has been trying to tell me he wants to have this called mapped lists instead. but. Uh, Actually, any map covers the more general thing. And it's, remember that we've told you for years that you should never, ever write things with mixed data types or uh, a mixture of nested and non-nested data. And we told you, yeah, you should never do this. And there's no way we're going to support that. Well, we're kidding. We do now. <laughs> <laughs> and you can write anything down. Now, if you wanted to access anything in them, we had to pull the whole thing back in again and then look what's where and where does this live. And that was very, very expensive. Now it can be mapped. And so we can just go jumping to exactly the place where the data is. There's two ways of accessing them. If you write it using set, then it behaves like now, that the whole thing has to be pulled in. And if that's something like reference data, that's fine, because you just pull it all in on Monday, and it's good for the rest of the week. If you want to be just jumping around in it, mapping into, well, page faulting into the various data, then you write it with one colon, and it's uh, got this extra thing of being mapped instead. And there's an extra, f so there's three files now. There's the file, the file star, which is the actual data, and then one that has the pointers to where the thing lives. So this is another one that from disk, this, can't be read from 3.5 back again. 3.6 can read 3.5 format, but you can't go the other way. These are new formats again. Finton said I can go over a, a minute or two. Something else that's new, and people don't quite realize, it's not actually an extension to Q itself, but the on-demand will have a big change to the way you write systems because this suddenly allows you to, okay, you've, you've got, let's say, four cores from us, but on the last Friday in every month, you really need 100 cores to crunch through stuff and s sort it all and then put it away neatly. 
And now you can, because if you just use 100 cores for two minutes at the end of the month, you could do that with the on-demand without having to buy all those cores and have them sitting bone idle for the rest of the month. And that's, I hope most of you know about it by now, you just go to ondemand.kx.com and you can get yourself a, a private use on-demand, 64-bit, just to play with. And, and then the same thing, if you want to have that billable then, then, then you come and talk to us, get yourself um, set up with on-demand rather than having to have permanent cores. Within that, you've got the ability to, to set the, the workspace size and the number of slaves that are in use, because if you're paying by cores used and stuff like that, you maybe want to be able to reduce the number of cores when you're not so busy. So that's that, uh, you can do those dynamically now. So nearly finished. Um, this is just a warning that before you go steaming ahead, converting everything to 3.6, <laughs> remember these things I've touched on quickly, that some of the formats have changed, that 3.6 can read 3.5 data in, and that's no bother. But you have to say it's the, the complex data is read in uh, read-only mode. It won't be writing back 3.5 format again. The new formats are things like the enumerations it's, once you've made that change, then you're sticking with 3.6. And you just have to read the documentation and play with it a bit but before you go rushing off and just move, migrating everything. Don't migrate everything Friday afternoon without testing. You really, really should look to check that all the data types are okay, that all your clients are moving to 3.6 as well, not that you've got someone who'd be accessing a database that suddenly some of the columns are in a weird new format that are inaccessible. This is documented on code.kx.com and these are things that it looks difficult to, to do or it looks complicated, then you just try it and actually it's not so bad at all. I'm not going that far that I would have a demo going here because having a client and a server, or a gateway, and then servers would be just guaranteed to go wrong. So I don't even try that. But if you set up some little examples for yourself, that will work. And you, you can see very quickly how easy it is. Talking about code.kx, Stephen back there is sort of the librarian and the person who's been doing a lot of the rewrites of 3.6. So if there's stuff that's missing or stuff that isn't clear about the new versions, just this is the man to go and hit. <laughs> and lastly, the people who did all this was of course Oleg, Pierre, Sergei, Charlie, Arthur, the, the whole team working on it. If you've got problems or you want to ask questions about it, then ask them or ask tech or ask in the Google group and stuff and uh, use these things because they're really good. That's it. That's...